Everything is found in the book of Genesis. And if you thought Genesis chapter 5 was trouble, the death knell chapter, we're going to tackle these first few verses of Genesis chapter 6, which has and does cause Bible students heart headaches and heartaches as they try to struggle with it. Headaches of the migraine. Any of you get migraines? <laughs> uh, you know what I mean then. Uh, sometimes you have to really think very carefully uh, to try and understand passages from the scripture. It's not that God is hiding anything back from us. There are things that we can't understand. There are things that he doesn't tell us. For instance, in the end of John's Gospel, uh, it says that if all that was said about Jesus and all that he did was written down, then all the books in the world wouldn't fill it. So there's a lot more to know than uh, we know at the, at the moment. But God has given us enough to base our faith on the Lord Jesus Christ. When you go through the Bible on a consecutive basis, you can't skip verses. Now, these verses I'd like to skip because they're difficult, they're hard. But if you consecutively go through the Bible, then you don't miss anything out. And sometimes we can just jump from, from Noah's Ark to Psalm 23 to Joshua to whatever, and it, it's... It, it's relatively easy, but we're missing out the bits in between that are important for us to understand. We're now at the 10th generation, you remember. You saw this slide last week. And Adam lived a long time. You can see how long he lived. And you can see that Adam was alive for most of Enoch's life. And when you think about that, and you look at the juxtaposition of these lives, you can see how important it is that the, the message was passed on to the next generation, and how easy it was, because they could go and ask. And if they'd forgotten, they could go back and ask. Whereas there are things, I'm sure, in your family, you think, what, what was uncle's name? I've forgotten. I'll go and ask me, oh, I can't ask me, mum. She's gone. Generations pass very quickly these days. But in that time, there were long periods of time when people could discuss these things. So we're up to perhaps 1656, if you count the, the verses. And, and the, uh, that's assuming we have all the generations, which we don't know. So it's a, a relatively long time. And the book of Genesis, of course, takes into account over 2,000 years. So that's why it's such an important book for us to understand. The long lives were due mainly, I suppose, to the re relatively pure genetic stock that was there in the beginning. Adam and Eve were perfect. When I teach this story to, to children, I say that uh, Adam was Mr. Universe and uh, Eve was whatever, Miss World, they don't do it anymore now, do they? But <laughs> they used to. Uh, they were perfect in every way. And then steadily, there's been degeneration, devolution rather than evolution of the human race. And there was a massive population explosion because of the long lives and because they were fit and able to produce and we're at a stage now where God is beginning to look at the world and see how wicked it is, even after these few generations. But why on earth did God inspire Moses to record these strange facts and what are their significance? Well, I'm going to have a go at it. Uh, you can make up your minds uh, what you think about these passages Genesis is the book of origins, as we've said. And unfortunately, this particular group of verses is the beginning of something very important and very tragic. It's the recording of the first demonic invasion of Earth. 
Really? Well, who are the sons of God? Well, the easy way around that, and what I used to uh, rely on without thinking very much, was, oh, they're, 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 the, sons, uh, they're, they're the sons of Seth, and they married the, son, uh, the sons and daughters of, of Cain, and, and they're, they're the godly line and the ungodly line. <sighs> No, <laughs> the more you read, the more you study, the more you realise this was angelic beings, fallen angelic beings, which, which we would call today demons, that are entering into the world and messing it up and making it much worse than it ever was. You'll see in verse 2, the sons of God, sons of God, and the daughters of humans. There's, there's the difference. The sons of God saw the daughters of humans were beautiful and they married any that they would choose. The sons of God, when that appears in the Bible, almost exclusively it refers to angels. In Job it appears on a number of occasions. And what actually happened in this passage we are reading tonight that there was this unnatural union between these angelic beings that somehow possessed men to be able to marry and to get involved in family life. And it violated the godly order. Human beings have been doing that for many years. We're doing it much worse in these days. We are violating the godly order order of things and when there's a God ordained order and we break it there's judgment that comes as a result the flood was the judgment that was coming Sodom and Gomorrah broke the godly rules they were not living the way God intended human beings to live you can remember when the angels came there to rescue Lot and his family the men of Sodom surrounded the house and they wanted to have sex with them. That's what was going on, the scripture records. And you think, what on earth? Well, it's, it's there in the scriptures that sin is getting worse and worse. So when you have a hybrid, you introduce difficulties. And this particular thing was breaking God's boundaries. I checked up when I was down at track uh, just this week. A friend of mine's got one of these hybrid cars. Well, there's nothing wrong with one of those. If you've got enough money to buy one, it's great. It charges itself up and does all sorts of wonderful things. But when we start mucking about with different groups of animals, for instance, I don't know whether you've uh, seen a leopong. There's one. It's half leopard and half lioness. You say, well, what on earth would you want that for? I don't know. People pay good money for this sort of thing, and it doesn't normally happen in the wild. In fact, lions and tigers, for instance, live in different places. So it doesn't normally happen at all. It's when we human beings get involved. You've only got to look at dog breeds <laughs> to see how we've... <clears throat> depending on whether you love poodles or pugs or whatever, Pekingese, uh, you've got to be very careful, I suppose, uh, if, if that's your dog. But some of the dogs, you think, well, they can hardly breathe. And they've, they've got broken backs, spina bifida and all sorts of things. You say, well, that's even within the same species. And they're all 98.8 wolf, aren't they? They came from the walls, and it's an adaptation that, generally speaking, human beings have got involved in to create the different breeds. Then we mentioned uh, a couple of weeks ago about the theory of evolution being the main thought that people have these days, and the main teaching in academic world is the theory of evolution. Well, Darwin came up with some finches, didn't he? Remember? These are Darwin's finches. Before 
Darwin arrived, they were finches. When he was there, they were finches. After he left, they were finches. What are they today? Finches. <laughs> so what have we learned? We've learned adaptation, not evolution. When we have a theory thrust down our throats, and it so often is in the academic world, that this is the right way, this is the only way, this is what happened, and they'll even tell you that 5.64321 million years ago, billion years ago, this happened. And you begin to think, am I being conned here? And I believe we are. God created the heavens and the earth. And if, once we deviate from that, once we deviate from what he planned, his kinds are meant to be kept together. Once you breed a lion and a tiger, or a tiger and a lion, you end up with a, a very much larger animal, which the mother doesn't like very much when she's delivering it. But uh, gigantism is one of the problems that they have. They have sickness. They are sterile very often, and they don't last very long. They have short life span. So it doesn't work that one animal transfers to another. Godly boundaries are there for a reason. And when we come back to this passage, where we're talking about human standards. What we are finding now is that people are saying, it doesn't matter what gender you are, you can be this, that, and the other. Well, you can call yourself whatever, but God has created male and female. Some have argued that these sons of God were the sons of Seth and others thinking that the kings wanted to make uh, a bigger harem. Uh, there's lots of ideas that people have to get around. But this passage is quite often spoken about in the New Testament. In fact, in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 4, it says, For God did not spare the angels when they sinned. This is referring back to this passage but sent them to hell, putting them in chains of darkness to be held for judgment. So they're contained at the moment, these people that cause this trouble, these demonic beings, and they are going to be judged in a future time. We often think of demons as being something that are fairy stories, but we, we get books like uh, Angels and Demons by Dan Brown. We get lots of films that come out about this sort of theme. It's, it's amazing that the film industry seems to believe more of the Bible than everybody else. Angels do exist in heaven and are working to God's plan. And the fallen angels, and Revelation chapter 20 tells us, uh, chapter 12 tells us that a third of the angels came down with Satan. There was a, a war in heaven. You can't imagine it, can you? But when you look at this one, uh, it makes it a lot easier. And Michael the archangel, I like that bit, Michael the archangel thrust out Satan and a third of the angels went with him. So there's a big body of demons available. Now we can't see them but we can see their effects. You've only got to think of what happened this week. Okay, it may have been mental illness, but why does an 18-year-old murder primary school children? Unless he's taken over in a possessive way by an evil spirit to do it. It's, it's, you can't imagine anybody just doing that unless there's something re really evil going on. So, the people of Noah's day and just before had chosen to join Satan's rebellion. Satan rebelled in heaven and the demons that came down have been causing trouble ever since. And we've only got to look around the world today to see the dreadful things that are going on. You say, well, why is that? Why would people do that? 
Why would people kill innocent people? They're being driven by their choice of following Satan rather than the Lord Jesus. It's tragic. There's an organisation called SETI. I don't know if you've heard of it. It's the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence. They spend billions on it. And people have been searching for E.T. and all the rest of it for, for, for years. And aliens, it, we make films about it. People believe it. They're looking. They're searching. Forget that. In fact, this uh, particular advert that I picked up off the net said, where will you be when we find life beyond Earth? Where will you be when we find life? How arrogant can men get? When we we can't even get to the moon easily. We've done that. It's a remarkable thing. But, you know, the, possibly Mars is next. But to get to another galaxy is, is impossible at the moment. And it's tragic to see that people are prepared to spend money on this sort of thing. There's an intelligence already at work in this country, in our lives, in the world in, in general. It has a demonic origin. And we've got to make sure that we are like Noah, people that are righteous, people like Enoch, who walk with God. Because so many people get involved in these things that are just not uh, the way God wants it to be. During the life of the Lord Jesus, there was an explosion of demonic activity. You remember it. Every time you, somebody came to him, there was, there was demons involved. And he cast them out. And it continued into the book of Acts. And it's still with us today. So we're suffering the result of demonic corruption. The sons of, uh, sons of God see the daughters of humans and... They produce other beings that are still human beings. They're not the answer to the, what people are, are actually asking for. They're asking for an answer to, to eternal life, to, an answer to death. And that's what Satan has always been promised, promising right from the word go. You'll be like God if you do this. And of course, once... We'd fallen into sin. Things went horribly wrong. The oldest book in the New Testament is probably the book of Job. I don't know whether you suffer that reading that. It's a lovely book, actually, in places. It's quite difficult to read, but there's some tremendous parts of it as well. And it's probably the oldest book that we've got in the Bible. And it's in the language of the patriarchal period. So it's about where we're, we're talking about now. And in Job chapter 1, and bent themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came with them. And that's, it's a strange thing, isn't it? What's Satan doing in heaven? He's just been kicked out, you know. Uh, but he seems to have the right to, be, to come back for some reason or other. Uh, and angels, in the Hebrew apparently, means sons of God. So those people that we were referring to earlier the sons of God were demons that possessed men and they married human women and produced, well, it may have been the Nephilim that we were thinking of the, uh, in our reading, the giants. They certainly caused havoc to the human race so that all the imaginations in the human being's mind was only evil continually and God had to say, that's enough. No more. Remember, Satan entered the Garden of Eden and he possessed a snake to speak his words of temptation to Eve. Notice in verse 3, God says, My spirit will not contend with man forever, for he is mortal. We are still mortal. And we can't get around that immortality unless we have that gift of eternal life that God wants to give to us. Noah 
was a righteous man, walked with God. Enoch, you remember, he went for a walk with God, as we said last week, and he had gone so far away from home, God said, well, why don't you come home with me? That's a picture of what's going to happen to those of us who have trusted Jesus Christ as our Saviour. We can be taken to be with him in heaven. And Paul, when he's writing to the Corinthian church, he was very, very concerned that they didn't get involved in the demonic practices that were prevalent in uh, Corinth and other places around at the time. In fact, if you've ever been to India, you'll see that there's, there's a decided influence there that it seems something very, very odd uh, and I remember a friend of mine who was with me on my last visit and his father had left uh, his mother and the parents and, 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 and his children and he'd gone out to India to find himself as people did in those days and he became one of these ascetics and he wore, wore very little clothing and he was thoroughly degraded as a human being because he followed this particular guru. And sometimes you can see these gurus sitting there with a lovely smile on their face when they're taking your money. And you think, well, what's going on here? And you know there's something dreadfully wrong with it. And false religion is just Satan trying to attract people away from the gospel message, from the truth of Christ. Anything will do. They don't care what you believe, as long as it's not Christ. And the important thing for us is to make sure that we don't get involved with that. In fact, the sacrifices of pagans are being offered to demons and they don't realise it. They're offering this and they're giving food to this God and they're worshipping another God. And it, it, If you've been there, you'll see just how evil the whole thing is because it's leading people away from the truth. It's leading people to believe something like reincarnation, which doesn't happen. When we die, we die. The Bible says it's appointed unto man once to die and after that the judgment. There's no coming back. And yet there are billions of people that believe in reincarnation. You think, well, what's going on? They're being told a lie. Later on, if we get that far in this book, we'll get to the Tower of Babel. You remember that? And the Tower of Babel was a, an indication of man wanting to be like God, building a city that was going to reach to heaven, to make a name for themselves, they said. Verse 5 tells us that the Holy Spirit was involved so we know in the original creation he was hovering over the waters and involved and he was also involved with causing man to hear the good, the good news of the gospel through those that, like Enoch and Noah who were preaching the good news to call people to repentance and he says in verse 5 that there's 120 years before the flood comes that we've already learned from the name Methuselah that we looked at last week, that when he dies, it's going to come. So they were warned that there was a judgment coming. Noah spent 120 years not only building, but preaching. And he was preaching that judgment was coming and nobody believed him. Well, I suppose he could claim his wife and his three sons and their wives as his converts, but that was it. Nobody else believed they were totally disillusioned. The whole thing, the, the lie of, of these demonic forces and the fact that people don't want to follow God, it was turned <coughs> into the situation where only eight went into the ark and were saved. In 1 Peter chapter 3, it tells us the good news. It tells us that Christ suffered once, the righteous 
for the unrighteous. The Lord has died on the cross. He suffered for us. Being put to death in the body, but made alive in the spirit. And the next verses speak about the fact that when Christ came back to life, after the, the resurrection, he went to speak to those imprisoned spirits, the people that we've been thinking about this evening, those who have been kept in chains, waiting for the judgment of God. God is going to judge the world, and it's something that we are looking forward to, really, that the, all that's wrong in the world will be put right by the Lord Jesus Christ. So I wonder... How many of us have got to the point where we've trusted Jesus Christ as our saviour? Remember Judas? Judas decided to sell his master for 30 pieces of silver. The Bible says, then Satan entered Judas Iscariot. Isn't that amazing? What we've been talking about, the demons entering human beings. And here, Judas is possessed by, the, by Satan himself. Satan did this job personally. Why? Because he wanted to get rid of the seed. Remember the seed from chapter 3, verse 15, the seed of the woman that was going to be the saviour. And he thought, I've got him, I've got him. But he hadn't, of course, because the very fact of the death of Jesus Christ means our salvation. <clears throat> And these days we're seeing things getting worse and worse for a very good reason. In Revelation chapter 12 and verse 12, it tells us that Satan knows his time is short. So he's stepping up operations. And we're seeing around the world things getting worse and worse. Politicians even this morning saying, oh, we're not going to use nuclear weapons on Ukraine. Oh, that's nice of you. <laughs> If you've come into a country and invaded it anyway. Uh, but it's there in their minds. And anybody that thinks of using weapons like that must be crazy, must be demonic. It's, it's something that's unbelievable, isn't it? It's something that you can't manage at all to think about. So are you trusting the Lord Jesus Christ tonight? Or are you willing to carry on following a false religion? There's, there's lots of them about. People say, oh, well, I'm, I'm good enough. <laughs> I don't need a saviour. I'm a good person. God's going to say, Come. are you absolutely righteous? Have you been cleansed of every sin by the Lord Jesus Christ? Or is there something missing from your life? It's important for us to trust the Saviour uh, and make sure that we have his forgiveness so that we can have this home in heaven. So Satan is going to have his head crushed. That's what the prophecy said. And on the cross, Jesus had his heel struck. It was uh, an injury, but he came back uh, from it and he's available to us today as our saviour. So I'm beg with, like Noah and others, I would say to you, please, if you've never trusted the Lord as your saviour, give your life to him tonight. Noah must have pleaded.